Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to another episode of What Do You Know About with Kat and I. Hello. We just wanted to start off the episode by letting all of our lovely listeners know that things are changing slightly with this particular podcast, starting with today's episode. Rather than doing multiple stories, we're going to kind of focus it down to one topic per week. I, Ash, will be your storyteller and historian, while Kat joins in as the live audience. I'm your voice of, I've never heard of this before and I have questions. This way Kat can kind of focus a bit more on her Twitch channel and a YouTube page, but still be involved. Exactly. We also have a project in the works that we'll be announcing early next year, so keep your ears peeled for that. So for this first episode of the new format, I'm going to focus on an incident that happened fairly close to home and is fairly more modern in the time frame of events. Okay. You didn't tell me, by the way, so that the audience knows, she refused to tell me anything about what she was researching. She said that there was someone that she found that she was very, very excited about, um, but absolutely refused to give me any name, detail, nothing. Like, I have... Like, I'm going in completely blind this time. Yeah. I really wanted to make sure that Kat was blind because I wanted, like, full-on reactions. <laughs> so, so tell me, who are we talking about? Well, hang on. So I knew about the location of this event, but I didn't really learn about the person involved in it until a recent trip to Chapters Indigo where I found a recent book that chronicles her life with a focus on this specific incident. Oh, okay. So Grant had to add that book <laughs> to the pile of Christmas presents, and I just quickly snatched it as soon as we got home, because he was like, yeah, I know you're doing this for the podcast. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> but with that said, Kat, mm-hmm. what do you know about Mary Steinhauser, if anything? Does the name even sound familiar at all? No, but I feel like it should. Okay. What if, if, I asked, someone... if, yeah. what if I asked you about the BC Penitentiary? I know a little bit more about that. Okay. Not a lot. So I kind of figured this would be all new to you, which is okay. why I kept you in the dark so that you couldn't do, accidentally do any searching like I've done. <laughs> um, and that's also why I was excited to get this down and, t- and to tell you all about Mary as well as a little bit about the pen. Gotcha, okay. So, the BC Penitentiary used to be basically an entire city in New Westminster. 65.5 acres, to be exact. Um, If you go to New West today, the area of Sapperton is literally where the pen used to sit. Like, it was created basically out of that land. It's now multiple blocks of over 1,000 residential homes and businesses, but it used to be our federal max security prison. Only right. one, sorry, only two or three buildings still stand, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Okay. So the BC Pen opened in 1878 and operated for 102 years when it was finally shut down in 1980. It was the first federal maximum security prison in BC as British Columbia didn't join Canada's Federation until 1871, and plans started for the pen in 1874. Right, okay. So it was a slow build, um, as it opened with only the main gatehouse, which is one of the original buildings still standing, and a few wooden or brick buildings to hold the original 38 prisoners, as well as the prison guards. The main large cell blocks that would hold the prisoners didn't start construction until 1904, ending in 1914. Security, yeah. So security also increased over the years, with the pen being surrounded by a wooden fence at first, before upgrading to a 30-foot wall made of rock, and then finally into a 40-foot concrete wall. By the time the pen was closed in 1980, there were cell blocks, offices, a hospital, a kitchen, work-slash-school facilities, and two chapels, one for the Catholics and one for the Protestants. Okay. There was no dining hall, which means that prisoners only got to eat in their cells. So they have all, the, they have all these other things, but they can't have a dining hall? Yeah. 
I think it was partially so that basically the prisoners didn't like weren't allowed to kind of co mingle. But they have a chapel in a school. Like I don't two chapels. Two chap. Yeah, that's right. They have two chapels in a school. So why? Well, I think the work in school. Dining hall. The work and school facilities were also for, like, the prison guards and, like, their families and stuff. Oh, okay. So, wait. So, so the school isn't for the, like, people, like, in the prison? It's for, like, the guards? I don't think so. Oh. Weird. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. If I was a prison guard, I feel like I wouldn't want my fan like, my kids going to school in the, the prison that I work at, you know? Well, I mean, like, it was basic. Like, it was, like, its own little city, right? So... Oh, you basically fair. lived and worked at BC Penn. Right, because it used to be, like, now it's obviously not a remote area, but, yeah, like, it used to be. Kind of, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, well, I guess that's fair. Um, so there's also a cemetery that was officially opened in 1913, but likely in use since 1912. It's also still around, with approximately 50 inmates still buried there, but it's now largely unknown as it sits in Glenbrook Ravine Park with only a plaque to tell people about the prisoners buried there. Oh. So I am, is it like all unmarked graves then? Um, I'm not sure. So I'm going to, I'm trying to convince either my mom or Grant that we're going to go for a little field trip so I can get like <laughs> current photos and actually see it. Yeah, fair enough. Because then I want to be able to like put up on Instagram to show people like this is what's left basically of the pen. Gotcha, gotcha. So, the basic daily routine is general knowledge, so I'm going to quickly share it here for everyone, as it'll kind of give you an idea of what, like, the inmates' lives looked like on a daily basis. 7 Mm a.m. was wake-up time, and then they had until 8 a.m. to get themselves ready, get breakfast from the kitchen, eat it in their cells, before they reported for work. They would work until 11.30 a.m., in which they'd then grab lunch from the kitchen to take back to their cells, where they would be locked in until their 1 to 3.30 p.m. shift. They'd then grab dinner from the kitchen before once again heading back for count and lock in their cells so that they could eat. Leisure period was held from 6 p.m. until either 9 p.m. in the winter or 10 p.m. in the summer, and all inmates had to be back in their cell blocks, counted and locked in by 11 p.m. Okay. Like, you know, strict routine, but that kind of is part for the course in prison. Yeah, so it doesn't so. sound like a bad schedule, but it yeah. wasn't the problem that drove inmates insane. From the inception of the pen, corporal punishment was the most preferred course of disciplinary action, with flogging being the guard's most favorite of the possible options. Yeah, this is where it gets bad. Um, it was slowly yeah. phased out over time until it was completely banned in the jail in 1972. 1972 feels a lot too recent. Ugh, okay. Yeah. Yikes. Other usual forms of punishment included working on the chain gang, which literally meant doing menial tasks like fixing roads while being chained to your fellow inmates, getting only bread and water for meals, and solitary confinement. Yikes. Yeah, that's really awful. Yeah. Imagine doing that kind of heavy later, like labor and only being able to eat bread and water. That's not enough nutrients to keep you going. No. For like a regular routine, let alone that. No. So solitary confinement was probably the worst of the punishments for the inmates. Mm-hmm. This is because of the lax use of administrative segregation, where the guards could lock inmates in solitary for as long as they wanted for whatever reason they wanted. So there's kind of three ways of getting into solitary. You could go in voluntarily, which would be mainly that you wanted protection from Mm. something, right? That was happening. from someone else in the prison usually. You you would go in for punishment that you actually did something, for sure, Mm. right? Or administrative segregation where the guards are just like, you know what, we don't like you right now. You're going to come into solitary confinement. We want to make an example out of you today. Exactly. So one inmate had spent a total time of 1,421 days there over a four-year period of incarceration. 754 of those were consecutive. 754? Yeah. Days. Humans are not meant to be alone for that long. That is so damaging. That's cool. 
That's um, so awful. Yeah, so BC Pen is actually known to being particularly brutal for modern prisons. In 1963, the penthouse was built as a replacement for the hole in the basement of the special correction unit. These cells were built to be extremely tight with three concrete walls, no windows, and a solid steel door with a square window making up five inches. That is less than a ruler length. Uh, that, like, man, I lose my mind after day two. Like, I, there's, uh, oof. So, so awful. inside the cell, they had a combination wash bin and toilet that had cold water only, a <sighs> radio selector with two channels, and a sheet of plywood four inches above the floor covered with a concrete pad as a bed. The volume of the radio and the temperature of the cell were controlled by the guards only, and the lights remained on 24-7 with them being dimmed to 25 watts at night. Like, I don't know what they were expecting that to do other than just drive people insane. Like, I don't know how that was ever supposed to be. I think it was basically like, hey, if you don't want to come back in here, you're going to be like the perfect little angel. <laughs> like, but it, it, but it doesn't make sense. But it's such bullshit because then, like, once... Like, I... Mm, I have so many problems with solitary confinement. Like, I could just rant about this for forever, but, like, it's it's so bad. Like, it's... Ah. Well, and it still gets worse. So, those who were in solitary for punishment would be in their cells for 23.5 hours a day, only being allowed out for a half-hour walk up and down the corridor with no view of the outside world at all. If they were lucky, they would get a rubber pad and a blanket for the night. If they were lucky, they'd get a rubber pad? The, if yeah, if they were lucky, they would get their like a rubber pad to put on like the concrete pad bed and a blanket right. for the night. Like basically, like just randomly get thrown it, and then in the morning it gets taken away. That's so dumb. Like I, like I don't understand. Okay, like uh, I. Mm. <laughs> This goes very, very quickly into the purpose of prison and whether it's the purpose of prison is meant to be like um, like a punishment or if it's meant to be rehabilitation. Because if your goal is rehabilitation, this is how you do the opposite of that. This is yeah. literally just like driving people to hate authority. It's literally just like, it's literally driving people insane, driving people to self-harm, driving people to suicide, driving people to like like it, how how are you how are you expecting people to follow the rules if you've already driven them crazy like that's how like how does it make sense why did we ever think that was a good idea i don't it understand it doesn't make sense i don't understand so if you were in solitary for protective purposes then you would be mm. allowed your pad and blanket for the whole like for like the whole day and night and you would sometimes be allowed to exercise outside for your half hour. So if you, okay, so hang on. So <laughs> if, I'm break, if I'm in prison, right, and I'm breaking this down, how afraid would I have to be before I'd opt into that? Because that's still awful. If those are the only changes, that is still really, really bad. Like, yeah, yeah. that's not, that's, yo, know, if, some, if someone was threatening my life and the only other alternative was solitary confinement, I'd just let them unalive me. Like, I don't, <laughs> like, uh, that's so bad. Well, speaking of unaliving people, only mm. one execution ever happened at the BC Pen, as the death penalty oh. usually was enforced by provincial prisons, not federal ones, when it was still legal. Right, okay. So, like, all of our other prisons, until it was illegal for the death penalty here in Canada, the provincial ones would do all the executions. The, right, I would have expected it to be more, but that makes sense. Yeah, so the exception was a 24-year-old man named Joseph Smith, who was hung in 1913 after he and another inmate killed a guard during an escape attempt. They literally built the gallow right where they killed the guard savage <laughs> um his accomplice died from injuries sustained during the attempt before he could be tried for the murder of the guard 
Right. So in 1934, the first riot took place in the jail, 56 years after it opened. I'm kind of surprised that it took that long, but... Yeah, right? They had a pretty lucky streak there. Yeah, so it changed some laws surrounding how inmates were treated when it came to the hard work they were forced to do. Because that was like their complaint, where they're like, you're forcing us to do all this hard work, and we're getting nothing back from it. So yeah. that's when the government started to pay them five cents a day for their work in hopes of keeping the peace. Still state mandated slave labor, labor, but you know, go off, I guess. That's the first step. As a first step, it's not bad. Yeah. And it kind of worked until the 1950s started to see a major overcrowding issue take place and the jail started, started to become extremely violent. BC Penn actually became one of the most violent jails in Canada as a whole by the 1970s, with it all starting off in 1963 when inmates started a riot and took hostages. In 1973, there was a three-day riot that damaged a pile of cells. Then the clocks turned to 1975 when all hell broke loose in the pen for the next two years. Three hostage situations happened in 1975, well, six took place in 1976. Holy, that went from, like, no riots to, like, so many all at once. Like, yeah. Was it all about the same thing, about the working conditions? And, um, like... Various things, right? Like, there was, um, I think, one of the riots, so one of the hostage situations um, was that these three inmates wanted to be moved so that they could be close, so that they could be at different jails that were closer to their families. That they were like, no, we okay. want to be able to have like, our families be closer to home, and then they can still come and visit us, right? Like, so they took hostages, right. and they actually did end up getting moved, okay, to where they wanted, kind of a thing. So it was like very, it was various reasons. A lot of it was just that they were like done with the penal system, and how mm. they were being treated. Where they're like, we're humans still, like. <laughs> Yeah, humans who did some awful things, maybe, but still humans. Yeah. Yeah. So, this history of the pen all leads up to my main focus of today's episode, Mary Steinhauser. Okay. So, Mary was born as Maria Elizabeth in 1941 to two immigrant parents. Her father came to Canada for a brighter future in the 1920s as Germany dived into the Great Depression. Uh, Because, like, a lot of, like, the European countries, especially Germany, their depression started in the 1920s. So when we were all Mm -hmm. having a boom, they were already going into the depression that then continued way longer for themselves than it did for us. And if I remember right, in Germany's case specifically, it was in part due to the, sorry, to the reparations that they had to pay after World War I, right? Yeah, yeah. Her mother fled Vienna with her family as World War II started um, in order to escape the Holocaust as they were Jewish citizens. Mm-hmm. Um, so three years after Mary was born, Mary's younger sister Margaret uh, was born. And it is Margaret's book called Between Blade and Bullet that I was introduced to Mary. Interesting. Ever since childhood, Mary had an extremely good heart. She got in trouble in primary school for speaking up against the government's actions towards Indigenous peoples. And Margaret says in the book that she doesn't think Mary knew how to willingly lie or tell an untruth. Mm-hmm. That basically Mary would do something bad and then person immediately be like, I'm sorry, I did this thing. <laughs> Don't punish me. Like, Aww. I can't. Let's just let yeah, it be. I kind of <laughs> have a guess at where this is going now. <laughs> Um, But it was one childhood event that seems to have put Mary onto the path that she ended up following. When Mm -hmm. Margaret was 12, she went swimming with a friend in these flooded meadowlands near their homes. Neither girl knew how to swim, but they were teaching themselves as there were no swimming lessons available to them. As they waded out further, Margaret's friend suddenly found herself drowning. She screamed for Margaret's help, but Margaret was getting pulled under by her thrashing friend, so she swam away in panic. Oh, no. Once on solid ground, she screamed for help until Mary heard her and came running. By the time Mary arrived, the friend was nowhere to be seen from above water, so Mary dove straight in to find the girl. 
At 15 oh years old, Mary found the girl, got her body to solid ground, and got to work trying to revive the drowned young lady. Just before it seemed that they had lost her, the friend started to cough and gasp. Mary ran straight to the nearest house, returning with some men who grabbed the friend and got her straight to full medical help. The friend survived oh. without any lasting effects. Oh, baby, she did everything right. That's amazing. Yeah, and, like, when, like, with the description that Margaret has in the book about how the two of them were trying, like, how Mary's like, here, this, this is what we're going to do, it was kind of, it wasn't quite the Heimlich, not the Heimlich, sorry, it wasn't quite like doing, like, compressions, it was, um, it's right, it was more of, like, almost like trying to, like, shake the water out and, like, using and like patting her on like, the back to try yeah. it because I don't because I don't think she knew exactly at 15 all about yeah. CPR right right but she managed to like but figure she, it out and like, kind of yeah so she managed to kind of like figure out some way that ended up working to bring this poor girl back yeah. um so yeah so in 1960 Mary decided for once and for all that she would like to be a nurse but not just mm. any nurse she wanted to go into psychiatric nursing. Oh, boy. The small town that they grew up in didn't really understand what the psychiatric hospitals were like. To them, yep. they were just full of crazy people who acted like wild animals and were insanely dangerous. Mary didn't yep. see them that way, but instead saw them as people who needed her care and compassion. So off she went to Essendale in Coquitlam. Oh, okay. We will be doing an entire episode one day on Essendale, um, but for the context yeah. of this episode, I'm just going to give listeners, like, the basics. Okay. So, like the BC Pen, Essendale was basically its own little town in the middle of a bigger city. It comprised of about five or six treatment buildings, a fire hall, a bowling alley, a farm, a library, a beauty parlor, a bakery, tennis courts, police station, post office, and a cemetery, just to name a few. So, like, it was... It was kind of like how the BC Pen was. It was like, you don't have to leave. <laughs> yeah, it's a little town. It's self-sufficient. Yeah, because the staff all had living quarters on the lands as well. So there, you can still kind of see a lot of like the huts and stuff like that. Like not huts, but like small buildings that were like your staff living quarters. Mm-hmm. Like staff dorms. Yeah. So it's now called Riverview, and there are new treatment sites on the grounds, while the old buildings that are still structurally sound enough are used for filming and paranormal investigations. Mm-hmm. Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, so, like, most of our listeners, like, if you've seen, like, Supernatural and stuff like that, um, Riverdale, I think, has been filmed there. Chilling Adventures of Sabrina have all, like, been filmed at the, uh, like, a couple of these buildings. I think it's usually the Crease Building and the women's ward that were that are used for filming. So when Mary went to Essendale, it was the number one training site for those who wanted to be psychiatric nurses. The training costs were much less expensive than going to the programs for larger general hospitals, so it was perfect. Okay. Trainees were even paid for the work that they'd be doing, as Essendale was still pretty overcrowded in many of the buildings and needed the staff. Okay, so like a paid inter- uh, paid internship or like... Yeah, so like paid a training. <laughs> nice. Sounds like a good gig. So Mary and her roommate were given their assignments, which really showcases Mary's compassion and how she saw the world. The roommate was assigned to the women's ward, and Mary was on the male post-operative ward. Mary made the ward sound heavenly with her quote-unquote sweet little old man uh, and other patients that she would describe. Like, one of them she even described mm-hmm. as looking like the celebrity at the time. Mm-hmm. Aww. The roommate would describe the horrible smells that she endured on, like, the female ward and was disgusted by what she saw compared to Mary. Later on, they were assigned new postings, and the roommate ended up going to the same ward that Mary was on. Mm-hmm. The roommate was apparently extremely excited to meet this quote-unquote sweet old man that Mary would talk about, but when she met him, she wondered what Mary saw that she couldn't see, because she looked at him and went, oh, you're just an old, wrinkly old man, I don't, like, Mary made you seem like this really sweet, cute little thing, right? And so she just saw, like, an old, like, a dying old man, basically. 
Wow. Okay. So it's just, you see the kind of the difference between like a strong sense of empathy and a complete lack of empathy. Yeah. And it's not even like a complete lack of empathy. I would say, I would say that Mary had like so much empathy that she would always see the good. Mm. And then this other person just saw what it was. She saw the horror of it rather than making it seem like a positive situation. And this roommate actually ended up leaving. Like, she couldn't handle it. And she's like, I'm too depressed. I cannot hit. Like, this is not the job for me. I quit. Yeah. I mean, yeah, fair enough. So Mary was so kind-hearted that she would apparently cry for the patients who had such deformities that they couldn't leave the bed or control their bodily functions. So, like, at night she would basically Mm -hmm. be tearing up, thinking about all these people. But she did also get used to some of the patients who were at first frightening um, and the Mm -hmm. language used by many of the patients. Because coming from a small Mm -hmm. town and and being raised religious, you're not going to hear all these swear words and slurs and everything, right? So at first it was like, what? But then she got used to it. You can get used to that stuff pretty quickly, though, in in the right environment where you're kind of steeped in it all the time. Like it, yeah, like that that sort of thing. I feel like, I yeah, it's one of those things that's different for everybody, I guess. But I feel like it doesn't take me very long. Like I grew yeah. up in a very sheltered environment. It didn't take me very long to adjust to like hearing that kind of language regularly and being less intimidated by it because of having that experience. Yeah, exactly. Because of, like, the work situation I was in. Yeah. But there were some things that Mary couldn't turn her compassionate blind eye to. Mm -hmm. So one of these things um, was that Essendale used electroconvulsive therapy on many patients as it was seen as a way to control their erratic behaviors. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, ECTs actually had the tendency of doing more harm than good, something that Mary could see from the time of her first introduction to it. But she stuck to her guns and learned as much as she could while continuing to rack her brain about any better solutions to treatments. Right. By spring of 1962, she received her diploma in registered psychiatric nursing from this program. She stayed at Essendale for a year before heading across the country to Toronto to tackle a position at the largest psychiatric hospital in Ontario. Wow. Big step. Right? So, she did have a number of positions at various institutions between Essendale and her final posting, um, which is what I kind of want to focus the podcast on. But each one of these positions did give her the knowledge and fueled her compassion for the people. She even went back to school to get her BA in psychology at Simon Fraser University, which opened in 1965. This time she actually wow. followed her younger sister Margaret, who was getting her degree there, and the two shared a duplex with two other young women who were also studying at SFU. Very cool. So after her degree at SFU, uh, Mary then went on to start her master's at UBC and ended up completing a master's in social work. Okay, cool. So she's, at this point, she's got, like, her BA in psychology. She's got a master's in social work. She's got, And she's got her um, diploma in psychiatric nursing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, like, a lot. (laughs) Right? Like, she... For a woman in, what is, no, you... 1970s. So in the the 1960s, yeah. So all of that happened in the 1960s, basically. Oh my goodness. That's a lot. Go get it, girl. So by (laughs) October of 1973, she was offered a position as a classification officer at the BC Pen. What is a classification officer? So basically, they do... Um, like individual counseling sessions, they work on like the pre parole, pre pre release planning, working on, so they they get to know the like the inmates, so then they can then take these reports to other community organizations and the people, like the law and the people who run the pen to be able to hopefully get these inmates when they were or like, when they are going to be released, then they can be released well into society theoretically okay gotcha 
So she had 60 inmates on her caseload. 60. 60. Six zero. Yeah. That's a lot of people to manage. Well, and then the one thing that I took from the book that Margaret wrote is that Mary had an amazing connection with each of her inmates. So, like, there's 60 of them, but she still managed to know them all personally. Yeah. Well done. So, multiple inmates had actually written letters to and about Mary full of gratitude towards her. Aww. One even wrote that she was their angel for saving them from the hell that was solitary confinement. Aww. This same inmate ended up turning their life around thanks to her compassion towards them. See, this is what I mean. This is what I mean about rehabilitation. <laughs> like, you can't rehabilitate people by showing yourself to be a monster as well. That's never, ever, ever going to work. It has to be done with, like, kindness and intentionality. And it sounds like she figured that out really early on. Oh, yeah. Like, I think, like, ever since she was a kid, basically, she knew that the way to people was through compassion and kindness. Mm -hmm. And she saw what was going on in the world that was wrong. Yeah. Like, the wow. fact that in, like, the 1940s, 1950s, she's talking back to her teachers about how the government is treating the indigenous populations. Like, even now, people don't really do that, the same, like, very much. It doesn't get nearly the attention that it should. Exactly. But, like, she was just like, uh, no, hang on, I see something wrong with this. And I'm going yeah. to fight about it. And so what if you kick me out of class? <laughs> so what you gonna do about it? Yeah. Yeah. She was... So, unfortunately for Mary, though, it can only take 41 hours for a life to completely change. Oh, no. I'm scared of where this is gonna go. <laughs> June 9th, 1975, started out like any other day at the pen. Her alarm went off at 7 a.m. and then again at 7.05 to make sure that she was actually getting out of bed. So same like us. <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah, like I've got like five of those. <laughs> yeah. Um, she got herself ready and drove into work. She'd spent the weekend worried about a remark that one of her inmates had made at their Friday session. It was enough of a worry that her roommate even suggested just using a sick day if she felt that something was going to happen that week at work. Ooh. But Mary said that she had too much work to do and went in anyways. So this inmate in question was Andy Bruce. Bruce was a contract killer and had attempted a prison escape once before in Saskatchewan. Mary saw something in Bruce and had a feeling that he could live a worthwhile life outside of the prison as like a leader and stuff like that like she saw his potential yeah bruce however was not so interested in having a woman holding the upper hand on him oh no so he didn't fully respect mary the, like, the same way that she respected him because it was like yes she was coming and helping him he kind of did have some respect for her but the idea yeah. that this woman basically could say like when she wanted to see him and it would happen he wasn't too happy about things like that. Like, priorities in this situation, my guy. You have this woman, she's supporting you, she's got power to help you, let her freaking help you. Who cares that it's a woman? Like, right? Uh, gross, okay. So when Mary arrived at work, she said hello to Bruce in passing as she went to go look at photos from a recent community awareness event with another classification officer. Um, so this classification officer, he had taken the photos at this event, and they had actually just looked at one of Mary, Bruce, and a indigenous chief who had attended this little gathering that they had at the pen. Okay. But they had basically just started to go through this roll of film when there was a scuffle at the door, loud voices, and then one of the other inmates appeared with a boning knife. Oh, 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 that's not good. Dwight Lucas was admitted as an accessory to an axe murder, but in this moment, he was taking Mary and her co-worker hostage. They were taken down to the vault, which was connected to room nine, where 16 people ended up being held. The majority mm. of them were classification officers. Oh, no. All 16 were frisked, and then Bruce called for one of them to be the principal hostage. There was a moment of silence before Mary calmly volunteered herself. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I can't say that I'm surprised that she'd do that at this point. But like, oh, that's terrifying. So the first thing that ended up happening was a knife being held to Mary's throat by Bruce as an official to the pen appeared at the window to room nine. The demands were made through the door. The three inmates wanted a helicopter brought to take themselves as well as their hostages to Vancouver International Airport so that they could be flown to a sympathetic foreign country. They okay, also, there's no way they're going to get that. They also asked for various drugs, including Demerol, and restraint equipment for the hostages. Okay, again, there's no way that they're going to get that. When asked if there was an alternative to leaving the country, Bruce immediately responded that they would kill themselves and all 16 hostages if they weren't taken out of the country. Mm. Oh, no. So, later in the day, an officer arrived with one vial of Demerol, which is commonly used as a sedative. He asked, he said that he could inject Bruce himself or give him a full syringe, but that he wouldn't give over like the full vial. Right. Bruce immediately threatened to slice Mary's throat, going as far as making the motion with the knife just over her skin. The trembling mm-hmm. officer immediately handed over the vial and Bruce injected some into Mary before handing the vial and syringe over to one of the other inmates to divvy out between the rest of the hostages. Just go ahead and use the same needle on everybody. There's no way that could possibly go wrong, okay? All through the day, the negotiation team from the pen came back and forth to discuss the terms with Bruce. One of the hostages ended up being released um, as they convinced the inmates that he had a heart condition and would die without his meds. Hmm. A portable toilet was brought in, along with sandwiches and soft drinks for the hostages and the inmates. Sometime in the afternoon, one of the inmates considered releasing the women hostages. Bruce turned to Mary and asked if she would like to go. Mary responded that she would stay, suggesting that they release the other two females and only keep five of the men. Nothing happened further. So everybody stayed. That basically just talk, so, right? Like, where they're like, maybe we should just let the women go. But then they ended up not doing that. Yeah, they ended up being, like, just, they so, so far, oh, so right now, there are now 15 hostages because the one guy did get released because they were right. like, he has a heart condition. If he doesn't have his meds, he will die. Like. Yeah. And stuff, right? Because the, they and really they didn't want to hurt. No good to yeah, they didn't want to hurt anybody unless they were, like, forced to. So they're like, okay, if that's what's going to happen. We'll let this one guy out. Okay. So, in the evening, Bruce requested a sleeping medication, and all the hostages were forced to drink it, so that they would just be knocked out for the night, right? Right, so, yeah. Because then the inmates could even try to get some sleep if they needed to. Yeah. The next day was pretty much the same. The demands were reiterated, and more Demerol was given to the hostages. But on Tuesday afternoon, each hostage was allowed to make one phone call. So Mary made a brief phone call to the family house um, in Seashelt, reassuring her mother that she was okay, making it quick so that the other hostages could have the time that they needed to talk to their loved ones. Mm -hmm. In the night, Mary was awoken by voices and saw Bruce having trouble injecting himself with the Demerol. She offered assistance, but was basically told to fuck off. They didn't want anything from her. She's a nurse. <laughs> yeah, well, if anyone but, knows how to do this, it's her. But she's also one of his hostages. Yeah. So he's probably he's like, "Hang on, you could just try to take me out, <laughs> right? Like, I'm not gonna give you that power." There's still like, I mm. <laughs> okay. So this was around 12:40 in the morning of June 11th. So everything started on the Monday. This is now, like, super early in the morning of the Wednesday. Okay. So this has been going on for a couple days. Yeah. So Mary kind of fell back asleep for, like, a little bit, like, kind of dozing in and out. And then all of a sudden, something was happening in the vault. Um, As one of the inmates was slashing around with a butcher knife, trying to stop the hostages from closing the door. He had what? blood pouring, this this one inmate had blood pouring down his face for some reason. Mary, they, so like, like it wasn't, like at this point, nobody really knew, other than like those who were awake, didn't really know what had happened. So 
but so most likely one of the hostages might have like attacked the inmate and then he was trying and then they were all closing the door to um bar themselves in so that they wouldn't get attacked back and injured right right so bruce immediately grabbed mary and pushed the knife against her neck he yelled to the hostages in the vault that he would kill her for what they were doing someone called back that they didn't care she was considered one of the inmates now what the hell yeah like is that a bluff or did they like i don't know i'm hoping it was a bluff, up. but this suddenly be doing everything to try to keep the peace like that's like yeah so suddenly she was turned towards the doors to the room as pounding footsteps echoed in the hallway. A window shattered and guns were suddenly being pointed in the room. Uh. Mary cried out, don't shoot, don't shoot. But her pleas f- fell over the ring of gunshots. No. One went into her shoulder and the other directly into her heart. She collapsed on the floor as a prison nurse rushed to her. She only had one uh. breath left. Oh, baby. On the day that the family buried Mary, an inquiry started about how she had died. No one else was killed that day, or really, full, like, bat, like, totally injured, other than Mary and Bruce. So they're trying to shoot Bruce, and they shot Mary as well. Yeah. So, it wasn't one of the inmates who killed her, of course, um, but yeah. one of the officers who was supposed to be protecting her. Of course, the officers tried to protect themselves. Robert Hollinger, who was reported by witnesses to be the officer whose bullets hit Mary, had reportedly swapped guns with another officer afterwards to try to cover his tracks. Oh, come on. No. Okay. That's just, that's just low. Like, I'm not going to take the fall for this, but I'm going to make you take the fall for this. No, no. Mm -mm. According to Bruce. What a coward. One of the other inmates was actually first in Hollinger's line of sight, but Hollinger shot at Bruce first, hitting him in the jaw. Both he and Mary fell to the ground, and when Mary was shot, he said that Mary was crawling towards him, calling to Hollinger not to shoot him. Oh my god. That is when the gun went off again, with that killing bullet entering her heart. So she she wasn't even, like... Like, I I assume that he had her, like, Bruce had Mary, like, in his arm. So he did at first. And that's when she got Then he got, so. No. So at first he did have her. Then he got shot. Then they both went down. And then she started crawling away from him. No, she was crawling towards. She was was crawling towards Bruce. But he's saying, don't shoot him. Like, Like, don't kill them. Oh, right? Towards Bruce, not towards the officers. Okay. Yeah. And that's when the gun went off again with that killing bullet entering her heart. According to Bruce, Hollinger didn't like Mary at all and especially hated him. So he actually wasn't surprised knowing the officer's personality and attitude towards the people in the prison. Like, so Bruce survived. Bruce survived. Bruce, the one who took 15 hostages and threatened to kill all of them. He's he's the one that survives, but Mary, the one who's just trying to keep the peace and just trying to get everybody out of the situation alive. She's the one that gets shot through the heart. Yes. That I... As she's continuing to be compassionate towards the inmates, even. That's messed up. Yeah. That's so messed up. This, I, like, oh boy. <laughs> Oh, man. So, by the end of the inquiry, no one was found at fault for Mary's life being taken. The jury decided that the officers had acted out of necessity because her life was being threatened by the inmates. They're the ones that killed her. They did, however, suggest that future hostage situations should perhaps be dealt with by an outside team rather than the people who may be biased. I don't say... Yeah. That's so messed up. That's, like, that's so atrocious. Like, oh, it was necessary to kill her for her own protection. It's, like, such this, like, that is the stupidest defense I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh. 
That's so dumb. But in general, the inquiry also found that the BC pen had multiple issues that made the situation take place. One of the things that I found interesting was the correlation between solitary confinement and these inmates. All three had been recently released from the SDU after a long time in confinement without any insistence for reintegrating into prison life. This is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. This is what I mean. This is like, uh... The inhumane conditions of solitary confinement was something that Mary had been trying to figure out how to solve before her death. Because she saw it and was like, this is not right. This is not humane. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to help matters. And was trying to figure out, like, what else could be done other than this form of punishment. Yeah, because it'll just break you. It'll just, it'll, it'll push you to the edge and it'll just destroy you mentally, physically. Like, you come out a completely different person. Like, it's... Like, yeah. uh. So the inquiry also pointed out a high turnover rate in prison staff and a lack of training due to the influx. There was also a major disconnect and communication issue between staff. Part of the blame um, was like the overall conditions of the prison being stuck in the past and the overcrowding. It was also found that there was a lack of security around the knives in the kitchen and a lack of proper alarms in many of the buildings. I, 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 I feel like that maybe should have been an obvious priority. You'd think, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That's... <sighs> uh-huh. So... As usual, the history behind these blemishes of our society have been slowly erased. Most people, if asked, can't really remember the pen or barely know that it even existed unless they were alive and lived here during its operation or the aftermath of it. Mm. And they especially don't know Mary's name. Right. Um, this is why I feel it is important to pay attention to the history of where you live and find those people who have had such an impact on your community. Mary's compassion should live on, even though it didn't work for her during the last 41 hours of her life. She gave hope to inmates who did get to move on and become contributing members of society after incarceration, though. She cared about everyone that she met and wanted to do what she could to make their lives better, no matter how small of a contribution it would be. Oh, man. So... I do implore listeners to find a copy of Mary's sister's book, Between the Blade and Bullet, because I only scratched the surface of everything. My goal with this podcast is to give you guys even the smallest look into history so that you can find resources and learn more if it grabs at you. But with Mary's story, I seriously think that reading this book will give everyone an outlook on the lives of prisoners and those who actually care about them as the humans that they are. Margaret goes deep into who Mary was and takes the reader on an amazing journey through the inquiries that took place after this incident that helped change the penal system in Canada. It's heartbreaking, but it's also extremely touching to walk in Mary's shoes through Margaret's words. Wow, what a story. I, yeah, no, I definitely, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I agree that, like, atrocities like this get covered up. And then we forget that they happened. And then we forget that, like, this is why we're at where we're at now. Um, is because this is where we're coming from, right? Yeah. Like, with all the issues that we still see in the prison system today, like, this was the starting point. And it's important to kind of recognize that as um, an answer to, like, why are things the way that they are? so that we can keep at the forefront the question like okay how do we make it so that it's not this anymore because clearly this doesn't work exactly um, and it's like and just because things have always been this way absolutely does not mean that they should continue to be this way yeah like as soon as i found this book i was just like what <laughs> like i well, thought i knew a lot of bc history and like these kind mm -hmm. of events but I'm like I had never heard of this how had I never heard of this well I took a course uh, a criminology course in university as like um uh as like a uh, an extracurricular kind of like option it's not really extracurricular but like I can't think of the word it's like a, a 
a course from outside of my program yeah that i needed to take just like a bonus course and uh it, it focused a lot more on um the correlation between women in crime so it talked about the bc pen but didn't really go into detail it said that it had it like it talked about it for the sake of talking about solitary confinement practices as an example of it being bad so i knew it was bad but i didn't know like yeah How like bad? i didn't know mary's story well i knew i knew it was bad and i knew it was like i it, it's just that course also talked about a bunch of different penitentiary like penitentiaries as well and ones that were like women's um women's prisons and that made names for being a problem in all kinds of other ways and yeah so I was, I was trying to place like which one it was in my head mm. it's kind of more so like I knew it was bad I was just trying to figure out like which one yeah yeah and then of course like yeah it didn't really like it talked about solitary confinement and how this was an example of how solitary is like so bad so 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 bad for you and long-term bad for the facility as well and it's just like no one benefits from solitary confinement except for the psychopaths who put people in it <sighs> but yeah like yeah i didn't know like details about you know it or mary's story at all so that was really really interesting yeah no i think and really infuriating at the same time <laughs> right is it's like oh wow this is like a really interesting woman oh shit our society oh. fucked her over <laughs> so much so much like like she would still be alive people... she would right. still be doing good things who knows what she could have done to change things being alive totally Comp- like... totally well and we always say that we need more good people we need more people like her but then we see like they come around and then we treat them like that like <laughs> yeah what the hell? well it's like at first I was like, oh, okay, like, is she going to get killed by one of the inmates during this hostage taking? Like, by an But that was my first thing. Like... But it's like, no, it's the society and the institution that caused the inmates to rebel mm-hmm. that ended up actually literally killing her. It's, like... <laughs> uh... Oh, it's one of those things where it makes everything feel so big and impossible to fix. And it's just like, oh, cool. It's just always been awful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, but we need more good people like Mary. And so like, it drives me bonkers how often their stories end in tragedy when we like when we do have them. Just because they're trying to do good and people just can't wrap their heads around that. Like it. <sighs> yeah. Oh, man. Yikes. That's all. I, that's all I gotta say about this one. Just a big old yikes. So, yeah, I'd like to take this as a call to be better. <laughs> yeah, or at least yeah. just have compassion for people. Yeah, any kind of compassion. That's all we ask. Like it's not a high bar. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yeah, all that's right. the Mar- that's the story of Mary Steinhauser. Definitely pick up the book if you have the ability. I have a link to um, it's Goodreads profile so that people can find it wherever they find their books but yeah definitely take a read because there's a lot more to mary than just what we share but i'm like i just want to make sure we focus on Mm -hmm. her time in the pen yeah that ended up being her last job yeah that's so tragic but on that note we will leave that here and we'll (laughs) see you guys all next week for maybe Something a little lighter and less tragic? We'll see. All right, we'll see y'all there. Bye.